This is the Georgia Farm Monitor. Since 1966, your source for state and national agribusiness news and features for farmers and consumers about Georgia's number one industry, agriculture. The Georgia Farm Monitor is produced by the state's largest general farm organization, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now, here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Well, maybe you didn't miss us, but we have certainly been thinking about you all week. So glad you tuned in for another edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. I'm Ray D'Alessio. And I'm Kenny Bergamy. Coming up on today's show, join us as the Monitor spends the day with famed musician and environmentalist Chuck Lavelle. His love for agriculture and why this Alabama native now calls Georgia home. Also on the program, for over 40 years, the people of Fitzgerald, Georgia have been dealing with a wild chicken problem. But is it really a problem? Some say yes, some say no. And how did they get there in the first place? And then later, how UGA's Master Gardening Program is helping to boost the state's economy. These stories and so much more starting right now on the Georgia Farm Monitor. At the tender young age of 89, Wayne Carr has seen a lot of peanut seasons in his 65 plus years as a farmer, and he hasn't let a few years stop him from doing what he loves. He's still going strong, and in 2015 was recognized for his work. Wayne Carr, a man everyone should get to know. I live four miles north of Donaldsonville in the edge of Miller County. Been farming all my life. I was uh, number seven of, of 12 children of a sharecropper, born in 1927. My daddy got a brand new Model T that year and he got a brand new boy. Paul come along, the take back man got the Model T, but he was stuck with the boy. But I've been farming ever since, what's, I think this is uh, 65 crops and enjoyed it. It's been I've always enjoyed farming. When I was a little fella, I wanted, that's all I wanted, if I could get me some land to farm. Now I got more than I can have, I'll have to get some help to help me with it. 1954 was the first year I ever saw peanuts with a peanut vine that didn't have uh, nuts on the bottom. We had a three quarters inch rain on in July the 4th. The next rain we had was in uh, November. So we didn't make any peanuts that year. But the next year was the first year I made a ton to the acre. So that was 1955. And been going good ever since. I guarantee I was scared to death of a debt. I didn't want to get in debt. But uh, the Lord was good to us. We had made good, well, not the best of crops. I don't know how we, uh, did so well and other folks going broke all around us, but uh, we, we did all right. Uh, yeah, that's, that's one reason I like, that's one reason I belong to the Farm Bureau, I like to visit with folks and so on. I was a supervisor with the soil conservation for 20 years, I enjoyed that. We met different folks. But I had a, I had a good wife, I must have had the best wife I ever come along. She stood with me. She, took care of all the household expenses and so on, signed all the checks and so on, never grumbled at all. She'd keep those uh, three little young ones. When I, was, when I was farming, if I had a job started that I needed to run on an hour or so after dark, I'd just stay at it. Back We didn't have phones and all back then. She'd keep supper warm, keep them young ones up, never grumbled right there with me. Yeah, but she had Alzheimer's, you know, it was 10 years there that she was, didn't know anything. But we was fortunate enough that we could keep her at home. I, I had a full-time helper that kept her, kept her during the day and I kept her at night. So we didn't have to, didn't have to, she died at home in her bed. And that was, when I think back over it, that was some of the most rewarding work that I had done all really? my life seeing after her. It just wasn't no problem at all. Yes, indeed, an inspiration to many. Well, moving on now, gardening, of course, is a favorite hobby of many around Georgia. And whether it's growing vegetables, planting flowers, or just enjoying beautiful shrubs around your home, the results can be very rewarding. Mark Wildman explains. Gardens enhance and add beauty to our surroundings. 
It does not have to be a world-class garden like Callaway Gardens in Pine Mountain, but can be the joy you get from your own little piece of the planet. Regardless of your skill level, there is a way to learn more and give back to others through the University of Georgia Extension's Master Gardener program. Master Gardeners are our outreach uh, partner um, with Extension. So we have about 3,000 across the state of Georgia uh, in counties all throughout the state. We range from the north to the south to the east to the west. Master Gardeners take a very in-depth 40-hour training course and are required to pass a test. After that, they are required to volunteer 50 hours of time the first year before being certified. You know, our master gardeners do that so easily and so quickly. Many of them will volunteer hundreds of hours each year, very willingly, you know, uh, because they're so excited about the projects that we're doing and what we're accomplishing in our communities. Master gardeners around Georgia add tremendous value to Georgia's economy. Currently, between the hours the, that master gardeners return in a typical year, we can see the value to the state. Uh, just for 2014, it was like having more than 80 full-time employees added to our workforce. I mean, that's the, that's the contribution of master gardeners in Georgia. In Coweta County, Extension agent Stephanie Butcher works with many master gardeners, not only do the volunteers enhance the landscape, they are very instrumental in creating a better community as well. It's probably one of the best parts of my job, and most of it has to do with the fact that they are volunteers, and they do come into the program because this is something that they're interested in doing as far as learning about horticulture. They are learn, wanting to learn more about gardening. They're also incredibly interested in working with people. And that's the main reason why I see volunteers come into our program. They want to teach, they want to help the public improve on their own landscapes and in our community to make it a more beautiful place and a better place to live. The volunteers will tackle many projects in a community, from clearing walking trails to beautifying public spaces. And each volunteer brings a unique level of skill to a project. What you'll see in uh, monthly are work teams that get together and do maybe a dig at a garden or come here and do some plantings at the greenhouse. They also are a wealth of information for citizens who are looking for a few good ideas. We go out, we speak to civic groups on different topics that they would like to hear about, like how to plant your uh, grass, how to make sure that you have a nice perennial garden, and what type of plants to use in your garden that'll work here in this part of the state. Not only do volunteers get out and work in the dirt, but they are also available to answer questions from the public. So whether you are asking about a bug you found in your garden or need to know what that flower is called, a master gardener is there to help. Having access to trained, knowledgeable individuals to answer your question is really valuable, you know, to, to, to everybody. Uh, so, you know, just that, that connection is really priceless, as they say. Reporting from Coweta County, I'm Mark Wildman for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Well, time to pay some bills when we come back. No bills, just beaks. After the break, how a simple experiment by a scientist resulted in the town of Fitzgerald, Georgia being overrun by wild chickens. Plus, he's best known for his keyboard skills with the Rolling Stones and other artists. But is it music or his love of the land that drives Chuck Lavelle? Hear for yourself when the Georgia Farm Monitor continues. Hi, I'm Cheryl Hain, the soon-to-be-retired general manager of the Southeast United Dairy Industry Association. I started at SUDA in uh, 1988, and things were a lot different than I was hired, actually, as the director of nutrition communications. So with a background in nutrition and doing some public relations work, I really came here to grow the program in order to tell the story of the great things about dairy products, the great nutrition about dairy to the public and really grew that program. Um, over the years we, we downsized a lot during the 90s because of uh, decreased income and I took on all kinds of programs. So I picked up all of our school program and our nutrition program, our food publicity program, uh, industry relations and writing our newsletter for our dairy farmers and uh, strategic planning which ultimately led me to be one of the candidates for this position of general manager, which I started in 2005. 
So it's been such a great opportunity to learn so many different aspects, uh, not only of promotion, but also of all the facets of the dairy industry. Uh, one of the ones actually we started about uh, a few years ago, and that's the Great American Milk Drive, where we really bring the community together um, with the dairy industry in order to support those in need. So it's not only asking the public to make donations for um, food banks to get their clients um, a gallon of milk, much needed nutritious product, but also staff have donated, uh, bringing together dairy farmers, bringing together processors who have all stepped forward to donate milk to food banks. So that's, that's been very key. Um, one other program is um, really taking a look at nationally reinventing um, fluid milk and the way that it's marketed to the public. As we know, um, with all kinds of changes um, in, in demographics, in competitors, we need to continue to promote fluid milk and get that back either on the table or um, out where people are consuming it at restaurants. So working with all facets of the industry, cooperatives, processors, retailers, in order to help them um, invest more in the dairy category, working as partners and creating new kinds of products in new places with new packages in order to get consumers really to pay attention to milk again. As the story goes, back in the late 60s, a government biologist by the name of Gardner Bump used a fish hatchery to introduce an exotic species of bird to the local Georgia wildlife. That bird, the Burmese red jungle fowl. Although its survival proved disastrous in that particular habitat, many of its offspring found their way to nearby Fitzgerald, Georgia. And so began the 40-year love-hate relationship between the residents of Fitzgerald and their uninvited guests. A quiet, quaint little town, Fitzgerald is nestled away in southern Georgia, just about 90 miles north of the Florida state line. Population, around 9,000. Chickens not included. They don't allow us to count the chickens in the population, but uh, in, a, in a comparison test, I'm not sure that they're not gaining on us. Although no official census has ever been taken, Fitzgerald Mayor Mark Massey estimates that the number of free-roaming chickens is in the neighborhood of between two and 4,000. And as the mayor of Fitzgerald, it's his job to instill peace and harmony, humans and fowl included. Hence, residents of Fitzgerald must abide by a few simple rules. If you're in a car, chickens in a crosswalk, who has the right of way? Uh, the chickens got the right of way in all circumstances. So. Uh, just, just know that uh, you give the chickens as much room as they need. Mm -hmm. Chickens in your yard, private property, messing with your flowers. Who's, uh, got, the, who's got the right of way there? Uh, you can run them out uh, if, if you think you can do that, but that's as far as you can go. <laughs> and let me tell you, these chickens are no dummies. On a hot summer day like this, temperatures in the mid-90s, sweat dripping off you. These little birds are spending most of their time in the shade. So getting these things on camera is nearly impossible. Nevertheless, the hunt was on. It's hard for these chickens to survive here but they've done it. And that's, that's mostly why I got involved. Meet Jan Gelders. Around Fitzgerald, Jan is known as the chicken's caretaker. In fact, if it wasn't for Jan, the Fitzgerald chickens might be nothing more than a distant memory. In 2004, she led the charge in a campaign to avoid having all the chickens removed. Those were tough times. The town was divided. Back then, we would call it the chicken fight, and it really was. And there were people that hated them and people that liked them. And we had newscasters from all over, and the Associated Press was doing stories that went all over the country about this fight that this little town had between people that hated them and people that loved them. 
we went to city council with petitions and the people that loved them won out over the ones that hated them. I think since National Geographic and Southern Living and the Audubon Society has been interested in stories about these chickens, it's protected them and made people aware that even though they may not be the pure red jungle fowl, that they retain some important traits and also bring a lot of people to Fitzgerald. Jan, however, isn't alone in her never-ending quest to raise awareness for the Fitzgerald chickens. Husband Winfred is pretty passionate about the little critters too. Just down the driveway from the house Winfred and Jan live in sits the chicken house, a personal creation of Winfred's and his labor of love. Well, this was an old house. It was one of the first houses built from the settlers that came from Minnesota. Later when I built my other house, I rented this for a while and, and uh, then I decided when I retired, I didn't want to rent it anymore. And, and I, I was remodeling it and I said, I think I'm going to call this the chicken house. And I know Jan like that. So I told Jan, I said, well, we're not going to rent it. This is going to be the chicken house. So it went from there. I've really observed these wild chickens for over 20 years. And quite recently, I've gotten into photographing them myself and documenting what they do during the day at night. And it's very interesting. They're not like your everyday chicken. And they're very intelligent and, and they survive. All right, Ray, great job as always. Now, a special look at how one musician treasures his southern roots and the land in which he manages. Today, we talk with keyboardist Chuck Lavelle. There have been lots of written words and plenty of talk about the talents of Chuck Lavelle. Not only is he a world-renowned keyboardist, playing regularly with the Rolling Stones and on occasion with Eric Clapton and John Mayer, he's also become well-known for his love of forestry. And that's evident when you walk among the pines at Lavelle's home in central Georgia. Well, you see, this is all my wife's fault. Uh, <laughs> Rose Lane's family has been connected to the land literally for generations, and uh, she inherited some property from her grandmother back in 1981. And it just became our responsibility to carry on what we saw as a heritage of stewardship of the land. So forestry seemed to fit my bill quite well. For one thing, uh, the first connection I thought of was, where does that wonderful thing that has given me my career and so much joy come from? And that piano, as we know, comes from the resource of wood. Chuck and his wife, Rosalene White Lavelle, told me they enjoy spending time together at Charlene Plantation and are always looking for ways to improve their surroundings. One way his farm does that is by constantly planting new pine trees. Rosie and I try to get together every day when we're here to do something outdoors, you know, depending on the weather, of course, but uh, we love it. We love being outdoors. I love the physical aspect of it. It uh, helps you keep in shape. It's good for the mind, good for the body, and good for the soul. Chuck said he finds a certain satisfaction in giving back to the community and state that he loves so much. You know, I, I just believe that uh, working the land, uh, having a family as strong as we have, helps you keep you grounded, you know. And those are the really important things in life. It, it's such a great opportunity for me to be able to go out and play with these wonderful artists, Rolling Stones, Eric Clapton, John Mayer, and others. But when you come back and you're connected to the land, you realize what your priorities are, are and uh, this is certainly a priority for us. I asked Chuck how he copes with the travel and grueling schedule of a multi-city musical tour with Mick Jagger and the Stones. You know, sometimes it just drives me absolutely crazy. You know, I'll be out on tour and it's wonderful. You know, you get to visit these great cities and play in front of big crowds and play the music, which is always awesome. But you know, part of my mind is back here at Charlene Plantation saying, well, did we get enough rain, you know? Is everything okay? And uh, so it's a, it's a constant thing. It's always on my mind. But I will say this, it's a wonderful balance to be able to do both. The Lavelles could live anywhere in the world, but they're proud to call Central Georgia their home. I am just a dying wool Southerner, okay? You know, born and raised in Alabama, Rose Lane says I defected to come here to Georgia. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I have roots in the South. The South has been so good to me and there's nowhere in the world I would live other than right here. When we come back to some, it's just a byproduct of nature. For others, it's valuable revenue. Damon Jones and why pine straw as an economically important product here in Georgia. Stay tuned. 
The Georgia Fire Monitor continues, as does the cleanup process from Hurricane Matthew, and one of the hardest areas hit was Screven County, an area that GFB President Gerald Long recently toured along with Georgia Ag Commissioner Gary Black. Upon seeing the damage, President Long saying the first thing that came to his mind was survival. My heart goes out to him and prayers that, that somehow that we, uh, you know, we are survivors. We figure out some way to make it. But with a combination, as I said, of low commodity prices, drought, and now this, it's going to be very difficult. I think it's a very critical time that the farmers in each community gets involved and let us hear what their needs are and what, what the challenges that we have back on the farm. Well, finally today, while it takes landowners the better part of two decades to make money off timber, tree stands can start generating money well before that, thanks to a growing demand for pine straw. Yeah, Damon Jones takes a look at why more people are getting into the market and what they can do to make their product more desirable. Just take a drive around any neighborhood and you're likely to see plant beds full of this stuff. And that's good news for landowners looking to get into the timber business as the demand for pine straw has seen a sharp increase over the past decade. Uh, in 2000, the first estimate, the first year that it was estimated uh, was 15 and a half million. It peaked out in about nine, 2009 and 10, 8, 9 and 10 uh, at about $80 million a year paid to landowners. With those kind of numbers, it's no wonder why more people are looking to get into pine straw as a viable option to make money off of their land. And best of all, they can do this while waiting for their timber to mature. It, it really fits into a situation where we can start raking some stands as early as age 8, more commonly around age 10, and rake on up until we have to thin the stand. Uh, and so it, it's a, an early income producer for uh, many properties and works out very well. And of course, those dollars are quite attractive when you can generate them early in the rotation as well. However, it does take work to produce high quality pine straw that the consumers want and the best way to do that is simply keeping the land as clean and well maintained as possible. What most straw producers are looking for are clean straw and that translates into what the, the consumer wants. They don't want weeds, uh, pine cones, sticks, briars, things like that. So trying to keep those stands as clean as possible from competition uh, that also helps the stand grow better when you don't have other competing vegetation out there speaking of invasive plants things like japanese climbing fern and kogon grass can affect the farmer's ability to rate their stands properly but with a little preventative care early in the process those problems can be minimized while also promoting healthy growth for their trees anything you can do to keep that stand clean is really a benefit and we can do that with several techniques of manually removing things uh, in some cases we can use herbicides particularly at younger years to keep those plants from becoming established so that when we get to the point where we want to rake the stand uh, we really don't have to do a whole lot other than maybe clean up some sticks and pine cones that's the ideal situation other management tools like uh, herbicide use is very beneficial and it helps not only uh, making a site uh, attractive for pine straw because it's very clean, but also there's benefit on the wood side too, extra growth because now uh, the nutrients and, and water that are present are going to your crop trees and not to a bunch of understory, uh, in many cases, unusable um, wildlife plants. As for those people looking to get into the pine straw business, Dickens first word of advice is to make sure there's a local demand for your product. So I said, before you start all this work to get a stand attractive to rake, you want to make sure there's markets for the basically contractors that are willing to buy your straw. You'd hate to do uh, a lot of work and then there's nobody interested in your straw. Reporting from Statesboro, I'm Damon Jones for the Georgia Farm Monitor. Damon, thank you very much, sir. That is going to do it for this week's edition of the Georgia Farm Monitor. Just a reminder for all the latest ag info regarding food, great recipes, and what's happening down on the farm, be sure and check out our Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest pages. You'll stay informed, see what's up in the world of farming, and here on the Farm Monitor Show. Take care, everybody. We will see you next week right here on the Georgia Farm Monitor. Have a great week, everybody.